Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your host, Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast. I'm Bob DeMarco. On this edition of the show, I'm speaking with martial arts luminary, knife designer extraordinaire, and head of Spider Co's special projects division, Michael Janich. Michael has a storied past, which includes military service, working with the DIA and other U.S. intelligence agencies as a language specialist, remote missions for American POWs in Vietnam and Laos, training in a wide variety of martial arts, and the creation of his own martial arts called Martial Blade Concepts. And of course, he designed the Yojimbo family of knives for Spyderco, a company for which he now works. If that sounds accomplished, you should know that that was just the elevator pitch. We'll find out more about Michael and what's new at Spyderco for 2024. But first, be sure to like, comment, subscribe, and hit the notification bell. And if you'd like to help support the show, you can do so on Patreon. Quickest way to do that is to head out on over to thenifejunkie.com slash Patreon or scan the QR code that you see on the screen. Again, that's thenifejunkie.com slash Patreon. Do you like the sound of the alphanumeric combinations M390, 204P, and 20CV, but bristle at 8CR13MOV and AUS-8? You are a knife junkie, probably worse. Michael, welcome back to the show, sir. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Good to see you. It's, it's good to see you too. And I want to congratulate you on the release of the Micro Jimbo, uh, your latest design with Spider Co. Um, let's jump right in. Tell us about about the Micro Jimbo. We're all familiar with the Yo Jimbo, but what was the need for the Micro Jimbo, and how'd you go about designing it? Well, initially, I didn't see that there was really a need for it. Um, what actually my approach to it. I do have people who live either in Boston or Chicago, other places where there's a two and a half inch blade length limit. And what traditionally I've been doing was taking full size Yojimbo you know, twos and grinding them down to what I call a Chicago Jimbo. Uh, so Chicago Jimbo just might happen to have one handy here. Uh, so that's basically what it looks like. So when you compare that to the Yojimbo, Yojimbo 3.2 inch blade and Chicago Jimbo basically taking that down to two and a half inches. So what that gives you, like uh, I'm from Chicago originally, still have family back there. My daughter was living in Boston for a while, so I found myself traveling to those locations pretty regularly uh, over a number of years. And what I wanted was something that I could carry that was legally compliant, uh, gave me the same grip that I'm used to, same operating mechanics, same opening mechanics and everything else that I'm familiar with, but I wanted to be legally compliant. So that's where the Chicago Jimbo thought process came from. Um, but what ended up happening back in 2021, um, Sal Glasser from Spyderco, Sal is a legend. One of the unique things about uh, Sal's approach to things is that he is still a very active member of the Spyderco internet forum. So he's on there every day. He's interacting with folks. And uh, there were some people who said, you know, hey, I like the Ojimbo design, but I want something that is truly smaller, smaller in the pocket, not just a shorter blade, but smaller uh, scale overall. So Sal reached out to me and he said, hey, would you be interested in designing something smaller? And I said, well, if, if there's a, a need for it, if people are expressing an interest in it, then yeah, I certainly would be. So my first effort, what I did was I actually took a um, Yojimbo 2 second. So got one that I got from the second sale and literally didn't even disassemble it, uh, fired up the grinder, opened up a beer, took a sip, grind a little bit, took a sip, grind a little bit. And basically that was my first effort right there. Uh, was coming up with something smaller. And what I wanted to do was um, in creating the design parameters for this, I still wanted to achieve that two and a half inch blade. I didn't want to just kind of arbitrarily sh shrink the knife down. I wanted to have a, a target goal. And also by shortening the handle, what I wanted to do was um, create something that would be easy for women to carry. So women's pockets are notoriously shallow. All the women who train in martial blade concepts, they're always complaining to me. It's like, hey, I'd love to carry a Yojimbo too but it's really difficult to carry in a pocket. They typically have to revert to waistband carry because uh, the pockets are simply too shallow. So in coming up with the uh, micro Jimbo, what I wanted to do was basically shrink things down. This is the actual production version that came from that. Uh, shrink things down to where the handle um, size was appropriate for a lady's pocket. 
So this is basically what we ended up with. The, the key things about this, um, what I really tried to maintain, were in the middle of the knife is what Spyderco calls the cockpit. So the cockpit is basically the dimensional relationships between the pivot pin, the trademark round hole, the stop pin, the lock face, all of those dimensions. And what I wanted was for those to remain the same. When it goes, when you go to open the knife, if you already have familiarity with the Ojimbo 2, um, or even if you don't, um, the dimensional relationships within the cockpit, I kind of fine fine tune those in the design of the Ojimbo 2. There was no sense in reinventing the wheel. So what I wanted was something that maintained all those uh, dimensional relationships, but then uh, shrunk everything down around it. So it's a little bit shorter uh, from top to bottom, so it fits smaller hands well. Blade is two and a half inches. Um, and also had a lot of calls from people, the, the original Yojimbo 2 design, whether people owned it or not, uh, there were people who were critical of the hollow grind. They were like, well, the, the tip is too delicate. I'd rather have a full flat grind. So I decided, okay, I'm the micro Jimbo, full flat. Uh, also, a lot of people are really enamored with deep pocket carry clips. Um, in my opinion, the height of carry is always dependent upon three things. It's the size of your hand, the size of the knife itself, and then the position of the clip. Those three things have to be balanced for you to be able to deploy the knife well. But in this case, the uh, deep pocket clip makes sense because the handle is shorter and again what you end up with when you compare this to the ojimbo 2 if i line up the pivot pins what you'll see is that the height of carry essentially where um where the knife would ride in the pocket is just about the same so oh, yeah. those up the, the bottom line is once you draw it out of out of your pocket your hand should be positioned to where you can open the knife extend the blade fully and not have to reposition your hand so that was kind of the logic behind where that came from. I know that when you're scaling down a design, oftentimes uh, th there are a lot of challenges in um, trying to trying to get a, especially a very popular design uh, to translate in a smaller scale. But it seems like if the cockpit is uh, is squared away, uh, it 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 might be just a matter of designing around aesthetics and effectiveness or aesthetics and ergonomics and effectiveness and engineering may be secondary almost. Well, by keeping the engineering the same, again, when, when we, uh, when I designed the Ojimbo 2, um, really looked hard at the lock geometry and everything else. When I handed that off to Spyderco's engineers, they were like, wait a minute, this is, this works. And I'm like, well, yeah, I, I kind of, <laughs> did some, you know, focus on that aspect of things to make sure I wasn't going to hand them a design that was unworkable. But when we did the lock testing, so Spyderco does uh, destructive lock testing for all of our designs in-house. We have a thing called, it's a hydraulic press called a Bender Buster. And um, the Yojimbo 2 scored very well. So in, again, designing the micro Jimbo, there was no sense to reinvent the wheel. Uh, although the shorter blade is not going to be, is not going to need the same lock strength you would have with a longer blade because the leverages are different. Um, again, there's no reason to reinvent things if the lock geometry is already sound and, and, you know, from an engineering standpoint, uh, it works. There's absolutely no reason to change things. Okay. So before we move on from the micro Jimbo to the rest of, uh, what's coming up for 2024, I want to address or ask you, uh, just a generalized question, especially given the fact that you are, um, uh, a, a founder of a martial art uh, based on knives, uh, based on small knives, self-defense. It's not dueling that we're talking about here. This is real effective, um, you know, self-protection kind of stuff. How effective is a small blade? Spyderco has a lot of small blades and uh, we uh, a lot of people like to carry them. But in terms of self-defense, how valuable are they? That's a great question. And that's one of the things in... In developing MBC, um, there's uh, the first thing that I teach whenever I introduce people to the Marshall Blake concept system is the logic of MBC. And the first thing that I emphasize is uh, you're going to fight with the knife you actually carry. And that should be something that is legally permissible in the jurisdiction where you live. You don't want to start your claim to self-defense with a felony in your pocket. So having a knife that is legal for you to carry makes perfect sense. Based on that, what you have to then do is quantify the destructive power of your carry knife. And almost 25 years ago, I developed a thing called Porkman. 
So a pork man, what I wanted to do was initially demonstrate the cutting power of an actual carry knife. So I took a five pound pork tenderloin, butterflied it up the middle, wrapped it around a wooden dowel, tied it on with a bunch of butcher's twine, and then wrapped it in about 30 layers of saran wrap. So what you end up with is a piece of meat with wood underneath it that represents bone. Uh, you've got a bunch of string that represents to a degree connective tissue. And then you've got the resistance of the plastic wrap on the outside, which kind of replicates human skin. And what you get um, in NBC, our primary targeting priorities, since we focus on stopping power, are the forearm. So flexor tendons and flexor muscles of the forearm take away the grip. It's Filipino martial arts defanging the snake. And then what we do is we take that defanging concept and we continue to apply that to other body parts. If you're defending yourself with a knife, that means you're facing an attacker with a contact distance weapon. So his ability to wield that weapon, which is basically the hinging of the elbow joint to wield that effectively, he has to have the bicep to retract his arm, tricep to extend the elbow. So if you take away bicep and tricep and you take away the adjacent nerves, the median and ulnar nerves, you're affecting the ability of the arm to wield the weapon. And then finally, the quadricep muscle just above the knee. That's what allows that leg to support weight, to extend the knee joint. And by cutting that, you achieve what's basically called a, a mobility kill. If you can drop him to one knee, you can create distance, create safety. And that really is, is your biggest guarantee of keeping yourself safe. So based on that targeting system, I then use Porkman to say, okay, can I cut all of these things reasonably uh, well enough to be able to achieve the predictable physiological results that I'm looking for? And the answer is yes. Um, when it comes to blade length, again, worst case scenario is you're in Chicago or you're in Boston, or you happen to be a federal employee working in a U.S. federal building, because all the rules are the same for those three. Two and a half inch blade length is what is the max that is legally allowed. So by having a Warncliffe profile with a two and a half inch blade, what I've determined through countless pork man tests is that I can cut to the bone through all of the primary targets of NBC and do that efficiently and effectively and reliably so I can create stopping power. So I consider two and a half inches to be kind of that least common denominator when it comes to blade length. I'd certainly want more if I could have it to, mm -hmm. to a, a reasonable degree. Uh, but if I were stuck with that because of geographic locality, because of uh, working within the parameters of the jurisdictions that I'm in, um, two and a half inches will still get the job done. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's a real important point. Uh, the legality of what you carry. I'm, I'm not always uh, as on top of that as maybe I should be. However, the, the laws have changed around me in such a great way, thanks to, to Doug Ritter, uh, that it's hardly a concern um, anymore. I, I don't carry these things behind me anymore. Uh, I've just decided that's uh, too risky. Uh, but luckily here in Virginia, things have uh, have have gotten better. But yeah, I, so um, it, the uh, for me, I uh, preference for folders, four inches to to three and a half, kind of on the small side. And the Yojimbo has always been one of the few happy exceptions where I'm, where uh, at three three uh, three and a quarter inches, it's one of the most uh, effective blades I have. One of the sharpest. I absolutely love the hollow grind. Um, I did once drop it on its tip, and that that had uh, that had a bad effect. Uh, but that was my fault, not a fault of the knife. And given the main priority of that knife, uh, hollow grind seems great. But I'm very excited to check out the full flat grind on the uh, micro jimbo because that's one of the one of the grinds that Spiderco does this but the best. And one of those Spiderco is who I learned to love the full flat grind through, uh, primarily through the military. Let's move on to some of the uh, new releases for 2024 and. Uh, well, of course, let's let's check out the military since I just mentioned it. Okay. Military so, two. I'm sorry. Military two. Exactly. So okay. here's the military two. Um, and basically what you've got is the the same basic profile that you'd be used to as far as the military. Um, but the primary changes here, a little bit of fine tuning to the ergonomics and literally what it comes down to. If you are a fan of the paramilitary two or the para three, literally the center portion of this is exactly the same. So all the, the uh, dimensional characteristics of this are literally the same. It's just been stretched out at, at each end. So it's kind of a, it, like if you took a paramilitary two and stretched it out. Um, also, this is an example of kind of the reverse engineering. The military inspired 
the original paramilitary and then the paramilitary too evolved from that and now what we've done is kind of taken the um all the the features and benefits of the paramilitary too and applied them retroactively to the military too so what you've got is a four position clip tip up tip down left or right side carry whereas the original military was right side tip down only this is drilled and tapped for or for all four positions in order to do that uh, it also has um, larger liners so the stainless steel liners on the military because it's a liner lock mechanism those were kind of minimalist they were maybe about two-thirds of the uh the handle length uh, in this case they extend much farther they're still nested so it keeps the knife uh, nice and thin uh, it's still an open back construction so it's lightweight and easy to clean uh, but those liners do extend farther because they become the anchor point for the four position clip and then very importantly is the compression lock mechanism so the mm -hmm. compression lock compared to a liner lock is not only mechanically much stronger but it also allows you to close the knife without ever placing your fingers in the way of the edge so you open and then you place your thumb on the side here, press with your index finger to release, and you never have to place your fingers in the way of the edge. So the military too, again, if you're a fan of the paramilitary, and many, many people are, it's one of our most popular designs. Um, literally what you've got is the size of the military, but with all the proven features of the paramilitary too. So I'm a big fan of the military. Um, I still have yet to get the military too. I, I have a long list and, uh, I will get to that at some point. Hopefully, with the black blade and the camo handle, I love that setup. It's beautiful. Like um, this one, yeah, <laughs> just like that one. Yeah, yeah. So what we're doing, just to be able to show that off, all of the stuff that we do, as far as our variations of the original military. So, from the black handles, uh, satin finish, CPMS 30V blade. What you have here is the digital camo handles with the satin finish. Nice. Uh, then you have black handles with a black DLC coating, so diamond-like carbon coating here. And then a combination of those two, which is basically the camo handles with the black DLC blade. Also all black hardware, including black liners. Ooh. And then just like the Military 2, we also... Um, are kind of supercharged in the design with CPMS 110V. So for the people out there who are really into uh, edge retention and corrosion resistance, S110V is one of the, the premium steels. And this uh, Spyderco likes to pair specific steels with specific handle colors. So the signature color for uh, S110V is what's commonly known as blurple, this kind of bluish purple color. Um, and that's what you'll see for all of our S110V models. All right, Mike. So I'm going to ask this question and it's going to make me sound like an ingrate, but I don't mean to. And I'm sure a lot of people, a lot of military fans have wondered this, but what took so long for Spyderco to kind of, um, uh, well, make these changes, which were definitely welcome, even even to include uh, the finger choil, like uh, instead of the rounded finger choil from the original one, having the concave, uh, every, everything about the new military too is... Uh, an exciting improvement. Um, what what goes on in a knife company like Spyderco where it takes time like that to to develop the military too? Um, I wish I had all the answers to that. Um, there are a lot of things that are, if, you know, to use the the popular government term that I learned when I worked for government. It's above my pay grade. Um, so <laughs> yeah. there, there's a lot of things that I I really don't understand. I'm not privy to everything that goes on at Spider Co. But one of the things that people don't understand uh, when it comes to knife manufacturing is that everything takes longer than you think. Um, so it's it's like anything else. You bring a new product to market, even though this borrows heavily from the paramilitary too. Um, when it comes to the idea of okay, if we extend the blade. Now there's going to be more leverage working against the lock. We want to make sure that the lock geometry and everything works well. So we create a prototype, uh, maybe do some production samples off of prototype tooling. We do lock testing. If there's anything that happens in the midst of that testing process that gives us cause for pause, we stop, we solve the problem, and then we move forward. So, you know, a lot of people think, well, you know, just do this. There is no just do this, okay? 
So everything has to be validated. You have to make sure that you're, you're doing things right. And sometimes you'll hit unforeseen problems. Uh, there are supply chain issues that affect the knife industry. Um, so when, it, when you look at availability of particular materials, sometimes that can be an issue. Um, sometimes we have issues as far as um, we do use some outside vendors for some of our processes. Um, and if they experience difficulties, then obviously, mm. you know, uh, that snowballs and rolls downhill to us. So, um, you know, it's, it seems it's deceptively simple to just say, well, just do this and, and, and make it that way. But you can't, you can't be, be that, um, it's not that straightforward. Sure. Sure. Well, yeah, uh, I would imagine it isn't. And also I would imagine you have to, uh, gauge demand, you know, do, is, is this something that we want to continue with or is the PM2 just the cat's pajamas? And that's like, no one wants the military anymore. So if, it, if that were the case, they wouldn't bother um, doing all this research and development. But um, so that I, I bet there's so much that goes into it, especially with a large company that that produces a lot of knives that all have to be at a super high quality control level when they leave. It, like, yeah, I would imagine the complexity is beyond. And, and one other thing also. So I'm. Uh... Basically, I do all of Spider Coast technical writing. So when it comes to writing catalogs, writing all the ad copy, writing all the product information guides, everything like that, um, that all falls to me. And I also have a uh, somewhat of a voice when it comes to our marketing strategies. But again, many of those decisions are above my pay grade. And um, one of the things that I push for, you may be familiar with Spider Coast reveal system. Yeah. So the reveals are basically what replaced what used to be our mid-year catalog supplements. And what's happened with the world in general is that because of the internet, because of social media, because of the immediacy of everything that we experience, people are spoiled. Um, and what it comes down to is it's like, okay, I saw that thing on the internet yesterday. I want to buy one today. Where's my clickable link? And Amazon should bring that thing to my front porch within the next 15 minutes. Okay. That's the expectation we have because we've gotten so used to having such conveniences, you know, Amazon, yeah. you order something and it's there the next day, sometimes the same day. So people have that expectation. We've been conditioned to that, but it doesn't apply across the board. So one of the things that I've been pushing for is let's not show things off until we're ready to deliver them because right. the expectation is there. We don't want to dis disappoint people. We don't want to set up a system that institutionalizes customer disappointment. Um, but at the same time, Spyderco has a really strong tradition. Uh, we are like the only company. If, if you go to SHOT Show or you go to the Blade Show or anything like that, we're the only company there that's showing off prototypes. So yeah. we have prototypes and concept models. You can walk up and it's like, what's that? It's like, well, we're considering making this. Um, you can't take a picture of it, but you can pick it up. You can handle it. We welcome your feedback. That's extraordinary. Okay. So when you look at that way of doing things, we like to show things off because we want to get that customer feedback, but it's a double-edged sword because you show somebody something and it's like, I like that. When can I have it? It's like, well, yeah. we, haven't made, we haven't even decided to make it yet. We're still getting feedback from it. Well, no, can I, can I buy this one? Can I have another one? We have another one tomorrow if I come back and they're conditioned to that type of immediate gratification. So it really becomes difficult because what we perceive as a long time, um, these days, it seems a lot longer because everything else is so so much accelerated. I, I think the best way to fully appreciate the Spider Co. Reveal system, I figured it out last year, is you got to go to Blade Show and check out all the prototypes and check out all the all and and then check out also all the announced new models and updates. And then you you get excited about them and then you wait to see what's coming out. I saw so many cool prototypes. Uh, that may or may not be coming out. I, I know that every time a new reveal comes out, I'm kind of on tenter hooks. Let's see what it's going to be. Is it going to, you know, hopefully I'm not going to spend too much money this quarter or whatever, uh, ho however often it is. But I think it's a very uh, smart way of doing it. It's also kind of a, a sad admission that uh, it's like no children, you know, you can't, you can't know what's coming out from Spider Co yet. Cause you're just going to keep yammering on about it until I break. So Again, it's uh, yeah. it's a balancing act, and you know what what I've been pushing for really hard. But again, that's I have a limited realm of influence. Um, is that if we don't announce something until we are really close, when we're you know at that point where it's like, okay, this is past QC, 
uh, we're putting the final pieces in place. Let's announce it digitally now and then put it out there and shorten that time between the announcement and the delivery. Um, I, I just think that would create such a great customer experience. But again, Spider has a very strong history of sharing things to get feedback from people and to get people mm -hmm. excited. It's hard to hard to move away from that tradition. So I, I understand both sides, but I'm, I'm much more a proponent of the former. So I understand there are some exciting uh, um, additions to the SALT lineup. Uh, tell us what the SALT lineup is, and just in case uh, someone doesn't know, and show off the one that you were showing me before. So the SALT series, Spyderco um, really has been an industry leader when it comes to creating knives that are built for extreme corrosion resistance. Um, so essentially using steels and using other other hardware in the knives, overall designs that are designed specifically for in and around use in and around the water, especially around salt water. Um, so the series, the salt series has been around more than 20 years. I think last year we celebrated our 20th year as far as um, the anniversary of our first design. Uh, but what we have now are three different steels that are used in the SALT series. So the original one was H1. That has been replaced by H2. Um, mm -hmm. So you can see the H2 on there. Uh, this one is the Stretch 2 XL Lightweight Salt. Okay, so what you had, uh, when you look at the history of this, you go back to the C03, which is um, the third knife that Spyderco ever did. That was the Hunter and the hunter evolved over time was originally designed as a a drop point folding hunting knife evolved over many many years to become the stretch then it became the stretch 2 then sal took that and he said let me extend that so we got the stretch 2 xl the extra large version we did that as a lightweight and when we did it as a lightweight we did it without any liners so i don't even know if you can see in there mm. but you, yep there you go uh, you can see that there's no liners in, in the handle at all. So for its size, this is about a four inch blade. This thing is exceptionally lightweight. This is about, I believe 2.9 ounces. Um, so you've got a four inch bladed knife that is at, or just under three ounces. Um, and again, the really, um, defining characteristic of this is H2 steel. So the original steel H1 was a game changer because it was an austenitic steel. It didn't go through the traditional heat treating process because it wasn't a martensitic steel that goes through hardening and tempering uh, the heat based processes. So what they would do is they would start off with a steel that had very little carbon in it. And they start off like seven millimeters thick and then uh, roll it out and compress it down to two and a half to three millimeters thick. So through that compressive process, what happens is the austenite within the steel transforms to martensite. Uh, so you end up getting the same martensite formation or the martensite um, uh, molecular structure that you would have uh, in a, a, a martensitic steel, but you get it through a totally different process. It's like a work hardened, like a train track kind of. It is. Um, so the term work hardening, um, one of the things that, as Spyderco's word guy, um, oh. I have to, in a lot of cases, take whatever information I can get from Spyderco, but also do a lot of independent research to make sure that whatever I'm conveying as far as our, our product information is as accurate as possible. And one of the things that has been really a boon to the entire knife industry is Dr. Laren Thomas. Um, so his knifestealnerds.com, his books, um, brilliant guy, amazingly intelligent, and he shared a lot of information about how steels work and how they don't work. He's also dispelled a lot of myths about uh, knife steels. So work hardening, mm -hmm. when you look at it um, specifically, work hardening is like when you take a piece of sheet metal and you bend it back and forth and eventually it kind of breaks in half. Uh, what you've done is you've created so many stresses at that bend point that it gets hard and brittle at that point and breaks apart. Uh, um, what's happening with H1 and H2 is a different process. It's actually a transformation of retained austenite through compressive forces and to a degree, low temperature processes. <clears throat> but the idea of you're going to grind on this steel or you're going to do something else that creates uh, additional hardness through abrasion, um, that is not... As we understand more and more of how the steel works, it's kind of clarified um, how the steel achieves its hardness. And it's not the way that we used to think it did. Oh. Yeah, Laren Thomas, I mean, uh, a, a genius and also uh, someone who's bringing 
bringing us great gifts as knife guys, especially in the form of Magna Cut uh, recently. And I know uh, you got some Magna Cut salts. What is yep. this? So the other one, as far as new products, the one I just showed again was the Stretch 2XL Lightweight Salt. This is one of our Magna Cut uh, products. So the first one we did was the Native 5 Lightweight Salt. This one is a Manix 2, uh, Manix 2 Lightweight Salt. So fiberglass reinforced copolymer injection molded handle, bi-directional texturing, uh, same uh, ball bearing lock and uh, reversible tip up carry clip. But the defining feature of this is CPM MagnaCut. So MagnaCut, if for your, your viewers, if they're not familiar with it, um, again, designed by Laren Thomas. And essentially what it was was a steel. When you look at uh, one of the ones that I always like to mention, because people are kind of familiar with D2. So when you think of D2, it was always kind of on that threshold of being stainless. So it was a, a tool steel that had desirable qualities of edge holding and, and uh, toughness. But when you would get to that point of um, corrosion resistance, it was always right at the threshold where it wasn't quite stainless. Stainless, most people use, usually say around 12.5 to 13%. Uh, it really depends a lot on the carbon content of the steel as well, as far as where you hit that threshold. But what Laren did was he was looking at it and saying, okay, when you add more chromium to the steel, what happens is the carbon in the steel combines with chromium to create chromium carbides. Chromium carbides are big, and because they're big, you know, relatively speaking, um, they make the steel more brittle because it's easier for them to break apart when the steel is under stress. So what he wanted to do was to basically kind of take a counterintuitive approach and actually reduce the amount of chromium in the steel, fine tune that with the amount of carbon and then add niobium and vanadium. So niobium and vanadium, what they do is they combine with the carbon to create niobium and vanadium carbides, which are very small, very hard. So what they do is they increase the hardness and the toughness of the steel. And then all of the carbon, basically it's looking for chromium, but it can't find it because the niobium and vanadium took all the carbon. So the chromium is left what's called in solution. It's left in the steel matrix, but it's not combining to create um, carbides. What that does is that promotes um, chromium oxide, which is the oxidation layer on the outside of the steel that makes it corrosion resistant. So MagnaCut is a really interesting steel that balances those properties of edge retention, corrosion resistance, and toughness really, really well. And it also, in our own testing, Spyderco's in-house testing, when we got MagnaCut, we started uh, doing our tests, doing our CAFRA tests and everything else, doing our toughness tests. And what we realized is when we got around to the corrosion resistance side, it was right up there with uh, LC LC200N. So when you have, again, H2 was our, uh, H1 started off, H2 is its successor. Then we had LC200N, and then MagnaCut came along. Uh, we found its corrosion resistance to be worthy of inclusion in the salt series, and that's why we decided to make our uh, make it the third steel in the salt series, and also to to feature that um, in our in our MagnaCut releases. We wanted to make sure that we came right out of the gate by highlighting that quality of it, its corrosion resistance. Uh, just in looking through the. 2024 spider coat catalog uh it really occurred to me and i know that the company has been doing this for uh a long time but it it seems now like it's more par for the course and that is uh offering a, a wider variety of exotic steels for many of the different uh designs um what what is it about this exploration of steel that that spider co is so hot on um, Sal has always been fascinated by the properties of steel. Eric has always been fascinated by the properties of steel. And we're always, you know, we have a, a saying CQI, constant quality improvement, uh, goes back to the Japanese principle of, um, Kaizen. Um, Sal was always a big, big fan of, um, the Toyota way, Japanese, uh, mm -hmm. industrial methodology. And, um, he's always looking at how can we make things better? How can we fine tune things to make things a little bit better, a little bit better. And obviously the steel, um, is something when you look at the properties of steel, not just choosing different steels, but also optimizing heat treat, um, looking at different coatings and, and whatever else you can do to the steel to really just wring out the most performance you possibly can out of it. Um, Spyderco has always been very committed to that. And, uh, I should know this better, but, uh, Last time I checked, I want to say that when you look at just our production knives, I believe we offer in the low 30s as far as numbers of wow. different steels. 
Um, I need wow. to double check that. But I know that in, in trying to compare us with other people or other companies in the industry, looking at other companies, very well-established folks doing a great job producing their own knives, nobody offers the breadth of steel choices that Spyderco does. Yeah, it's it's really an aficionado's brand, which is which is interesting because it's also uh, within reach to almost everyone. Some sort of product in the Spyderco line or Spyderco bird line <clears throat> is within reach and uh you know you could even go to bird and get things like the the wave opener the emerson wave opener some features that are that seem rather exclusive uh, uh on the more expensive spider co so uh it's not only embrace it not only has always embraced innovation but also it's been there for aficionados not only of of steels and heat treats but of grinds and of locks and other sort of um innovations yeah we really try to we really try to offer a broad scope of products and um when you look at steels one of the ones the, that i also like to mention i don't have a, an example of it in front of me at the moment but many people love the tenacious mm -hmm. so the tenacious is kind of a gateway drug uh <clears throat> if you want to get into spider co stuff it's one of our value folders it's actually actually the flagship of the of the uh value folder line been around forever and some people just love it they're like this gives me everything that i want in the spider co knife but at a really affordable price and the real compromise that we make in the base version of the G10 handled uh, Tenacious is the steel. So it's HCR 13 MOV, basically a 440C-ish type of steel. Nothing that anyone's going to get really excited about, but when it's rendered well, when it has good edge geometry, it's a great workhorse knife. Well, we decided that we were going to take that and similar to our Mule Team project, we we're going to basically kind of supercharge a Chinese-made knife with a premium american made steel so the first thing we did was uh cpm s35 vn uh, so a lot of people love s35 they love the toughness of it they you know compared to s30 v a little bit tougher you give up a little bit of edge retention but they wanted that toughness so that was one of the things we did the most recent thing we did was uh added cpm m4 to a tenacious mm -hmm. so now what you've got is really an efficient autos tool steel if you love to do sharpening if you love those acute edge angles if you like you know just really getting into the the um kind of the higher levels of the sharpening experience if you will um m4 is a great steel for that but typically you have to really invest in a premium knife to, to be able to get m4 to have that available in a much more affordable platform and especially let's say you carry a tenacious and you say okay i've got my hcr 13 mov one here this is my original now i'm ready to start exploring higher quality steels and see if there's a performance difference well like any other good experiment what you want to do is change one variable so if you mm. change the blade steel and now you're using a steel, it's like, wait a minute, you know, you may be, maybe you're a, uh, a tradesman or something like that. You're an electrician, you're a construction worker, whatever it is. You work on a ranch, you're using your tenacious and you say, okay, typically I touch up my knife once every couple of weeks when it starts to get dull. I upgrade the S35VN and now it's like, wait a minute, every three weeks I get to the point to where I need a little bit of a touch up. Huh. Okay. Now I can start to appreciate the performance differences between something 440C-ish and something like S35VN. Then you say, okay, let me take that a step further and do that with M4. And now it's like, wow, you know, maybe once a month I'm at that point where I need a little bit of a touch up. So it really becomes a great way for people who are kind of exploring the performance of knives because frankly, most people, they think they know about different steels, but they've never done enough work with them to really experience a difference. Okay. Uh, but for uh, the people who do cut all the time, this is a great opportunity to be able to experience that and really quantify performance differences. This, this made me want to ask you a personal question. What do you think about people such as myself? Uh, and maybe I shouldn't have uh, stated it that way, but I, I have in my collection different steels and I've never been like a steel collector. I'm, I'm more um, collect on design and, um, well, uh, other other things, but I'm always kind of proud of, oh, this one has 20 CV, but I am not a, as you were saying, constant cutter. I am not someone who needs to touch up his blades every three weeks. I might do it just for fun, but I don't need to. So collecting steels, even though you don't use them, it's, is that like collecting Ferraris that you uh, just drive 25 miles an hour? I think for some people it's true. Um, 
you know, and again, the, you know, the customer is always right. If you get something and you're pleased with it, then we're happy that we gave you something that, you know, meets your needs. But realistically, you know, I'll have some people sometimes where they'll come up and it's like, well, you know, if this knife was made out of XYZ steel, then I'd buy it. And it's like, okay, <laughs> that's, that's an easy excuse not to buy something that you weren't going to buy in the first place. Okay. Yeah. But for the average person, if you said, okay, can you actually appreciate if you had a blind test where the, the knives weren't marked and you handed somebody something that was made out of S35 VN and something out of 8CR 13 MOV, would they actually use those knives enough to get to the point where they, they realize, wait a minute, this one doesn't hold an edge quite as long, or this one doesn't sharp, this one sharpens more easily than this one. You know, are they really challenging the knives and challenging their skills with the knives enough to make those quantifiable differences. And I think for a lot of people, it, it's not true. It, it doesn't, you know, diminish the fact that if they're happy with a, a 20 CV knife and, and that satisfies their needs, that's awesome. I'm happy for them. But at the same time to, you know, pretend that, well, you know, I could tell the different smells like 20 CV, yeah. you know, okay. yeah. no, I'm sorry. You, you got to do better than that. You know? Well, that's, that's how I felt when I got my first Magna cut uh, knife in June, I was like, awesome. I have Magna cut now. And I was like, cool what am i gonna do with this well you know i have magna right. cut now and for a collector you know that's good enough i mean uh and and hopefully if i ever you know need it advanced cutting you know capabilities i'll have that and i'll i'll take it out and like um, you said as, I, a, as, a, as a collector what's great about it is you can look at it when you look at all the different flavors of paramilitary two for example yeah. if you're a paramilitary two enthusiast and you say okay I've got to have the Magna Cut version when it comes out because I've got, you know, the original S30V and I've got S45VN and I got S110V and they're coming out with a Spy 27 version of it and they're coming out with this. If that, again, is something that gives you pride, gives you pride of ownership yeah. because you've got every variation, awesome. We're doing our job well. Um, but when, you know, people come up to me and it's like, well, you know, this deal is not as good as this deal. And it's like, how do you know? I'm always curious about that. It's, I feel it's a fair question because if you're not using the knife in such a way where you can appreciate those differences, then you can't appreciate those differences. You can't quantify them. Yeah. Uh, something just sprang to mind. I wasn't going to, I wasn't going to bring this up, but I embarrassed myself this week and destroyed one of my absolute, well, I didn't destroy it. I changed its course in history. Uh, my, my beloved street buoy. Uh, I have this, on me a lot i had it i had it in my belt i was on the backyard messing around i find that it's very good to throw if i'm close and it's a no spin throw and uh i like doing that and i was doing something else cleaning up in the backyard and i thought i would kind of surprise my target and uh and draw really quickly and threw it and i was at a weird angle and it hit and it snapped and i heard the sound and it 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 broke my heart for a second but then what i found so beautiful is i looked at the grain structure in the sun and man it is a flawless i don't know it's just kind of cool to see i never really want to see the inside the cross section of my uh spider co knife but it looked it looks really like it's a perfect piece of steel so i'm going to grind that down make a little uh, broke back sacks out of it make a go. different sheath and um uh, keep running with this thing and what I that comes it. out to for you know for your uh your followers who may not know they may look at that and say well that that shouldn't happen there's a difference in heat treatment between knives that are designed for throwing and knives that are designed for cutting and spider co in most cases we're going to err toward the idea of edge retention versus toughness but when you look at a, a, a true purpose design throwing knife you're looking at something rockwell low 50s you know, like if, you know, 52, something like that for a cutting knife, you're going to be, you know, at least a 58, 59, ideally more like a, a 60, 61. And with that hardness comes brittleness. And that's just, that's a trade off trade offs that you make. That's just. The yeah. Yeah. Thing. Yeah. To, to be clear, I was not properly, I was not using the knife for its proper purposes. I was being, uh, I was being, you know, Jason Bourne when no one was looking and, and, uh, <laughs> just embarrassed myself. Uh, no but yeah, uh, I love this thing. Uh, and anything else from Spyderco that we should know about that's coming out that that uh, that you're excited about? 
Well, we had talked a little bit about the idea of, again, comparative steals and all that type of stuff. So one of the things yeah. that's really unique about Spyderco is our mule team project. So the mule team, uh, it's an idea that Sal came up with uh, a number of years ago. So a mule is basically a test blade. So when you're looking at uh, testing a particular steel or what will happen is they'll get different blades and they'll say, okay, we want to find the sweet spot for performance of this this particular steel. So let's make identical test blades, but what we'll do is we'll work on the heat treating process and we'll say, okay, how does it perform at a 59 versus a 60 versus a 61, you know, whatever that range might be and try to find that sweet spot. So that's what mules are about. Well, Sal wanted our customers to be able to share in that process. So a number of years ago, we started uh, creating basically their just blades. So this is the one that I'm going to be sharing with you, but it'll be a good representative example. Uh, but it's just a blade comes unfinished like this. So there's no handles on it. doesn't come with a sheath or anything like that. Um, and what it's designed is you can either buy aftermarket scales and just kind of bolt them on as a turnkey solution. Or what you can also do is um, actually use it as a kit knife if you want to get into knife making and just start off by hafting your own knife. I want to design scales for this and you know, put them on myself, uh, it gives you that, that, uh, capability. So the mule team, uh, we've, we're up to, this is MT 40. So this is the 40th mule team blade wow. we've done. So when you think of all the different steels, when you think of everything from HCR 13 MOV, all the way up through exotic steels, um, CPM 15 V, um, just all kinds of stuff. Um, what it gives the consumer, the ability to do is to buy a blade that is the exact same shape, exact same edge geometry and everything else as the last one they got. So the platform again remains consistent. And what you've got as the difference is the steel itself. Um, in this case, this is high impact ceramic. So this is Whoa. again, M MT40. In this case, it is a, a ceramic material um, that is actually injection molded. So it's molded into the shape um, and it is extremely hard. So when you look at ceramic knives, uh, ceramic knives like Kyocera knives and everything for the kitchen, uh, super, super hard. When you think of Spyderco sharpening, uh, sharpening tools, our uh, sharpening stones are typically made out of ceramic. Mm -hmm. So you're talking, you know, well over Rockwell 70 uh, for those things because they have to be harder than the underlying steel. So this is extremely hard stuff. Here's an example of one, uh, that I've taken some of our aftermarket scales and, um, just bolted those on. So this is the turnkey solution to be able to put, uh, a handle on the knife. Um, and this is going to be again, our first ceramic, um, mule. So ceramic, even though this is called high impact ceramic, it is still a ceramic material. So compared to steel, it is, uh, significantly more brittle. Um, so this is something that, again, you treat it as a cutting tool. Uh, you certainly don't want to throw this. You don't want to abuse this in any way where you cause any kind of lateral, uh, lateral flex to it. Cause even though it's called high impact ceramic, it's still a ceramic. So, uh, what, uh, that's exactly what I was going to ask. It seems like thin ceramic, like you would have, especially towards the edge and Spyderco is, uh, has such thin behind the edge uh, measurements. Uh, I was going to ask if that's brittle. Um, is that like, like drop on the table brittle, or is that more like the kind of impact you, you would be used to avoiding for a regular with a regular knife? I know that we did do in-house testing as far as some limited impact testing to make sure uh -huh. that we weren't producing something that was so brittle that it would be, you know, right. uh, it wouldn't be workable as, as, a, as a knife blade. And I know that we did some of that. We were, uh, I wasn't privy to all the testing that went on with that, but we did discuss that somewhat. Um, and it does have enough impact resistance to where we consider it to be a usable cutting tool. Oh, but cool. again, w when you compare it to any type of steel, um, it's not going to be able to withstand the same lateral forces and everything else. Um, so it, it is a very different animal. And okay. it's one of those things where, again, um, you know, a lot of people say, well, how does it, you know, how does it behave when it does this? What about this? What about this? Part of the magic of the mule team thing. And one of the things that Sal wanted from the very start was for our customers to share in that experience. So rather than saying, you know, we're going to tell you exactly how this thing performs and exactly what it's capable of. We want that feedback. We want that to be part of the process where we all kind of discover that together. We do the initial testing to make sure it's a viable product, make sure it's a viable material. But then from there, it becomes a kind of a communal experience. Uh, 
yet another thing that I find uh, very appealing about Spiderco are the collaborations. I mean, you're you're chief among them in my book, but uh, Fred Perrin, we mentioned him before. Um, I mean, so many uh, collaborations with designers. Uh, what do you have anything happening right now uh, collaboratively with uh, designers out out of house that are uh, of note? We we always have stuff that, that is going on with collaborators. At any one time, Spiderco has at least 100 projects that are in development. <laughs> so when you look at the number of different designs and everything, um, and this also, when you look at, um, for people who are not thoroughly familiar with Spiderco or who don't understand the nuances of how we make things, when you look at stuff like this made in Japan, very first Spiderco knives were made in Japan uh, before we even had our U.S. factory. Currently, about 30% of our product line is made in our U.S. factory. We also have our Taiwanese-made products, um, and our Taiwan maker is incredible. If you've never yeah. been to Taiwan, if you've never looked into the, a lot of people will lump Taiwan and China together, they couldn't be more different, not only politically, but also as far as their capabilities and everything else. The Taiwanese industry infrastructure is amazing, and they do some things from an engineering standpoint better than anyone else in the world, in my opinion. Uh, we also work with Italy. So when you look at not only collaborators, when we're looking at different designs and saying, okay, we like this design that's coming from Sean Houston or something like that, um, that's great. But then what we also want to look at is, okay, what performance characteristics do we want for this design? What engineering ch challenges might it pose? And which one of our makers would be best qualified to produce that knife? Mm -hmm. So it really becomes, again, when you look at it, uh, and this is one of the other things that people will be like, why don't you just take some, some H2 steel and shove that into a pair of three and call it good? Because H2 steel is made in Japan. You know, to get that all the way from Japan to the U.S. is a challenge all by itself. Just like when we ship U.S. made steels to Taiwan or, you know, uh, to Japan for use there, the shipping of steel back and forth. And then you have to make sure that wherever it goes, they have the proper heat treating uh, facilities and protocols to be able to handle that. So one of the ways that we enjoy such a broad scope of products is also by leveraging uh, all of our different makers around the world, all of our different manufacturing partners, and really just taking the best advantage of their uh, their qualities and, and their uh, capabilities. So again, when you talk about collaborators, if we have like a high-end custom knife, something that is really sophisticated, like um, Oh, I'm trying to think of a good example. Like when we did the um, the Kapara knife. Oh, yeah. um, that is just such a beautiful pocket knife, radius carbon fiber handles, and you'll just look at the sophistication of that design. It's like, okay, how do we render that and do it as close as possible to the custom version of it? Well, our Taiwanese maker does an extraordinary job of that, so he was the best person to be qualified to do that. So that's where that particular one went. And that also, once you do that, then you say, okay, well, what steels can he work with? What what other you know materials can we bring into play? So all of these things, um, when you look at the way Spyderco does its business, we're, we're one company, but within the one company, there are subsets of products where do you want something that is ultra corrosion resistant and designed for hard use? Okay, great. Here's our salt series. Do you want a pride of ownership piece? Okay, here's this knife that's made in Taiwan. Do you want to buy USA made and show your patriotism by buying a high quality US made product? Okay, great. We've got that as well. So we really offer, it's not just how many steels do we have? How many designs do we have? We really, um, I think, cover such a broad spectrum um, that, um, the deeper you look, I think the more you appreciate how much Spyderco does. Uh, and Spyderco is set up to be, I'm going to compare you to case knives, but only in this way. Case knives are imminently collectible, and it's the same thing uh, with Spyderco. You were talking about the PM2s. I know uh, I know people who collect PM2. That's their collection, and, and you know, they have every handle material, every steel, every combination, and... Um, or, or if you're a you know collector of certain types of designs or certain designers, um, uh, I think that Spiderco is is uh, is one of those places because you can get these ultimate uh, uh, you can get these uh, endless variations like you can with the 
with the mule team. Let me ask you this, uh, bes besides your own knives, which I would assume are way up there, what are you, what are your favorites? Uh, um, you might be in a touchy situation working for Spider Co. saying so, but do you have any uh, any pets? Um, obviously anything from Fred Perrin. Fred has been a, a dear friend of mine for a long time. Uh, I love his designs. I love the the impact that he's had on on the industry as far as his design features, the index finger hole, uh, the deep index finger choil, um, that type of stuff. He really had a profound impact uh, from a design standpoint on the industry. And um, I've taught for Fred, I've trained with Fred, have huge respect for him and uh, just love his designs. Um, Kelly McCann's Canis, I was also um, oh, yeah. very much involved in, um, when I was back in the day, when I worked for Cal Paladin Press, I worked with Kelly, we talked about knives. Um, there's, there's actually, uh, I did a video for Spyderco that traces the history of the Canis and how um, I gave Kelly a first generation Yojimbo. And that kind of was a paradigm shift as far as his thought process with regard to blade shape. And that kind of led to the development of the Canis. So um, Kelly is one of my favorites. I wish we would do more stuff with Kelly. Uh, anything from Ed Shemp. Uh, Ed is brilliant, um, not only as a knife maker, uh, but also his understanding of ethnic knife designs. He's Spyderco's go-to guy for uh, our ethnic series. And that's one of the other things, again, when you look at ways that Spyderco has kind of distinguished themselves. Um, there are a lot of companies out there where it's like, hey, we're doing a kukri or something like that. That's great. But Spyderco has really, uh, over the years, paid tribute to a lot of really cool ethnic designs from various yeah. cultures around the world. And um, those were some of the early ones. We had Bob Lum's designs that were included in there. Um, Edward Bradachansky, we had a number of different designers in the early days. And then Ed Shemp kind of took over that process. So things like the the Euro Edge, uh, the Crease, um, the Barong, the Kukri. Yeah, the Barong uh, was so sweet. He did that oh, yeah. buoy. Um, yeah, he did. Yeah, the Shemp so Bowie. Cool. Uh, he also did oh, the Shemp the Persian. Rock, the Persian. Yep. So when you look at Ed's designs, his ability to take a traditional ethnic design and then kind of massage that into something that is a a modern folding knife uh, is just yeah. extraordinary. And he's just such an awesome guy. So he's he's one of my favorites as well. I remember when um, his Navaja. That was his, right? The yes. Navaja. I remember uh -huh. when that came out, I just about lost it because I'm a that's one of my favorite knives of of all time, the Navaja. Yep. And to see how he modernized it, kept the Spanish uh, spirit to the blade, kept that ratchet um, lock uh, in the in in that modernized sense. Uh, man, what a what a cool, cool knife that was. Yeah, absolutely. And also, if you ever get a chance to go to Spain, my wife and I celebrated our 40th anniversary a few months ago, oh, went to Spain. Thank you. Uh, but there's a museum in Spain in Albacete, and they tra trace the history of the Navaja. There's actually, uh, let's see if I can grab it here without. This is actually notebook of a knife maker. This has a lot of the, um, essentially from their exhibits, mm. it traces European knife design from various countries all around the world. Um, one of the most amazing museums I've ever seen. But if you're into Navajas, if you ever have a chance to go to Albacete, um, Albacete it was that's... just awesome. Just an amazing, amazing museum. And uh, if you're a Navaja fan, can't do much better than that. Just incredible stuff. Okay, let me ask you this uh, as we wrap here. Um, uh, so much stuff that I didn't get to, but we can, we can, I can ask you some of this in a, in our, uh, after interview that, uh, patrons can listen to, but, uh, in terms of you, in terms of a knife designer, I know you just, uh, you just released the micro Jimbo and you have a lot of designs in your past for other companies, which we haven't even talked about. Uh, but what do you have in mind for your next knife design? If you have anything cooking, um, so one of the things that I would like to do is to uh, revisit the idea of a, a neck knife. So when you go back, the history of the Yojimbo started with the Ronin, with the design that I did with Mike Snowdy uh, way back in the day. And the original impetus for that design, in fact, I might 
might even have one handy because I knew you were coming. Um, <laughs> so this was the original concept model for the Ronin. Ooh. So that's the Mike Snowdy one. Um, and then a even prettier version of that, if I have it here. Yep. So those oh. are Damascus. Wow. So ladder Damascus, uh, Mike Snowdy custom version. But um, the idea of a small fixed plate. So I'm getting ready to go to the Iwa show at the end of the month. Um, and in Germany, you can't carry a one hand opening lock blade knife. It's illegal. But you can carry a small fixed plate as long as it's not purpose designed as a weapon. Um, and um, I'm not getting any younger. Uh, a number of my students uh, are also getting to that point where they're just having dexterity issues with their hands. So as far as one hand deployment of knives, as we train MBC, um, some of them are just getting to that point where we, we call it earning your draw, getting your knife into the fight. So transitioning from empty hand skills to getting the weapon out. They just find that more challenging as time goes on because of dexterity issues and uh, just lack of hand strength, maybe arthritis. Uh, some folks are experiencing that. So we're exploring more and more the idea here in Colorado, you can also carry up to a three and a half inch blade as a fixed mm -hmm. blade. So some of my guys are actually transitioning more to the fixed blade side. Um, so designing something that um, would kind of fit that neck knife realm or inside the waistband carry with a static cord carry, uh, kind of going back to the original theme of the, the Warncliffe fixed blade that kind of started my whole tactical Warncliffe um, journey almost 25 years ago, uh, kind of going back to revisit that. So I think that'll probably be the next thing I design. I, I hope uh, this question, uh, it, I want to ask you just one more question. You said tactical Warncliffe journey. That's a long journey. We've talked an awful lot about it. Um, but just before we get out of here, just in case anyone's wondering, why is it that the Warncliffe is, uh, in your opinion, uh, superior uh, in a slash? Okay, so this, uh, this again, is the original Mike Snowdy um concept model there is no sharp edge on this so as i'm running this across my finger i'm not doing anything irresponsible okay so when you look at a knife that has belly to the edge so if i turn this over um and we imagine that this is the cutting edge here your body is always going to move in an arc so your arm any any type of motion you make is going to basically be an arc when you're cutting well if you're moving in an arc and you get to a point to where the arc of motion of your arm and the curve of the cutting edge run parallel you're no longer pressing, you're not no longer applying pressure into the target. You're not cutting any deeper. When you look at a Warncliffe, again, no sharp edge here, but this, as I'm applying pressure, it never gives up. It's cutting with increasing pressure all the way to the tip. It never gives up. And unlike a hawkbill or a karambit where it's hooked, this also won't snag on bone. So if you're cutting a limb or something like that, you can cut down to the bone and you're never going to hit that point to where you snag, you get tangled up or anything of that nature. Um, you're always cutting with maximum power all the way to the point. And again, we go back to that idea of um, you don't want to start your claim of self-defense with a felony in your pocket. So you want to start with whatever knife you can legally carry. Well, if I'm limited to, say, a blade of whatever length it might be, let's say three inches if you're in Los Angeles, for example, then I want to make sure that whatever I'm doing with this blade, it's going to cut with maximum power. I want to create the, the maximum destructive capability within that knife and anything that i do that diminishes that by having the blade curve upward it sacrifices cutting power and if you don't believe that go down to home depot and you say okay i need to get a utility knife what are you going to find you're going to find a razor knife with a worn cliff blade it's actually closer to a sheep foot but it's going to have a perfectly straight cutting edge if you pick up an exacto knife same thing it's going to have a straight cutting edge you're always going to cut with full power all the way to the point so from an industrial standpoint this is something that tradesmen have understood forever um, it's just the idea of taking that and applying it to tactical knives was something that wasn't a thing going back when I first started pushing that. Um, actually, give you one more show and tell if you're up for it. Yeah. So when I've discovered the cutting power of the Warncliffe, actually, I lied. I'll give you two more show and tells. Doing pork man testing, the knife that cut the best was a classic Senefante from Spyderco. So this is a Frank Senefante design. Uh, and I was just blown away when I was doing Porkman with this thing because it was like, why does this cut 
better than everything else in my collection. So what I did from there was this is my very first handmade prototype that oh, wow. I made. This was kind of the, the beginning of what became the Yojimbo design way back when. So I wanted something with perfectly straight cutting edge. I wanted something that had a tapered handle, kind of like a traditional Japanese uh, Aikuchi. So you didn't have to have a guard added for insurance, Fred Perrin's deep index finger choil here, but something that had a nice taper to the handle. So it fits your hand really well. But this is a, a liner lock that I made wow. back in around 2000 or so. So this was the first concept that kind of started that whole journey. Um, and everything kind of went from there. Wow. What a, what a great place to, uh, to bring it back on home to. That is so cool. I'm glad I got to see that, uh, first homemade or handmade, uh, Yojimbo prototype. That is very cool. Uh, Michael Janich, thank you so much for coming back on the knife junkie podcast and, uh, talking with us about spider co and your own career. Fascinating as it is. It's been great talking to you once again. Great talking to you as well. I really appreciate the opportunity. Thank you for the time. And uh, I'm happy to come back anytime you want me. Awesome. Take care. Thank you. You too. There he goes, ladies and gentlemen, Michael Janich of Spider Co. and Marshall Blade Concepts. Uh, lots to talk about. If you are a Patreon, uh, Patreon member, uh, go check out the interview extras we're going to do on uh, this. I'll be asking him some interesting questions, and, uh, and uh, be sure to join us there. Also, be sure to join us uh, for Thursday Night Knives this week, and don't forget, uh, next Wednesday's uh, supplemental, as always. For Jim, working his magic behind the switcher, I'm Bob DeMarco saying, until next time, don't take dull for an answer. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, thenifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at thenifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on thenifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at thenifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to Bob at thenifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487 and you may hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. Mm -hmm.